So, hello everyone to the Flamingos Podcast. Today I'm here with Jonathan Gaffner on the cast of Season 2 of Trillo and Suede. Thanks for being here. A uh, little correction, Adam. Jonathan Gaffner is not here. He's a fictitious character. This is Trillo over here. Yeah. Uh, he's Suede. And there's a mistake in the screen there. I see it also, but uh, I don't know how to correct it. We are uh, not so good with the, the technical stuff here. So I guess uh, he was using our computer. Yeah, I mean, Swade says he's fictitious. It's debatable whether he's um, real or not. There is a character who calls himself Jonathan Geffner. We're not sure his true identity. All he knows is he's a fan. And he's a, a deranged fan. He thinks that he writes the scripts for us. He thinks that he even created our characters. <laughs> He's basically a nut job. Look, like <laughs> we don't mind him hanging around whoever this character is. He, he's right over here now. He, even, he does some work for us. And they ask, why do we have him around when he's a nut job? Because he, he does it for free. He doesn't charge us. We can use all the help we can get with clerical <laughs> stuff, you know. Publicity, yeah. promotion, stuff like that. So, so this guy goes by the name Jonathan. He even started the, uh, the Trillo and, S- and Suede uh, group on, on Facebook. So he is, is very helpful. So far, no harm, no foul. So, uh, you know, it's, we let him hang around, let him have his delusions. That's uh, really good to hear. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's fun to be back with, uh, with a bunch of the cast members from season two. And I, uh, See, uh, I recognize them all. They, they've got the wrong names there, also. Yeah, I think they're they're playing a role here. They're playing a role, like <laughs> the, uh, Christopher is uh, Chris Chris Torm Goose. He's really Goose. Goose. Yeah, but he's playing a role here. He's a, a different character called Christopher. Christopher Torm, Mark, um, uh, you know, Rabbi Lustig, of course, is his real name. Yeah, and he's doing a character called Mark Lothers here. Gregory Levine, oh, that's Big Boychik. Can't miss him. Big Boychik, of course. A very uh, uh, terrifying uh, gangster leader from Chicago, spends a lot of time in New York. The this name Big Boychik was redacted by the FBI. Is that what happened? Well, Allegedly. I, I, think I, I think I'll understand what happened once I look up the word redacted. Um, Mrs. Lustig, yeah. Okay, oh, there she goes. Yeah, Mrs. Lustig. Of course, that's who she really is. She goes by the name Josephine, apparently. Then we got Joe, Joe Rashbaum. Uh, well, of course, um, that's using an alias to cover two names. Why don't you introduce yourself in the? Uh, I mean, you know, not the character here. I mean, the what you you know in the series as you appear. Remind everybody. Of course, well, should, I gotta be uh, honest with you. I'm I, I'm a Gemini. I was born in June, so us Gemini's we always have at least two identities, and the first one of which was uh, was was John Elwood because I'm this big, big, big yeah. TV psychic, and I can tell everything about you, Adam Dinsley, right from across the pond. It's really, really true. But yeah. the other thing is that I grew up in Brooklyn, so to be honest with you, sometimes you gotta act like a tougher guy than you really are. Yeah. And uh, for that, we actually have to play uh, Bishop, the uh, very stereotypically Guido bouncer at uh, the last exit nightclub. Yeah, but I got to point out that I, I really think your true identity underneath it all is, uh, is the bouncer. Bishop. Yeah, because we, we settled that in episode two of season two. We exposed him, Adam. He's a, he's a phony. Oh, okay. Uh, you know, psychic. Yeah, calls himself a psychic. <laughs> Some kind of psychic. So we exposed him. Well, whoever he is, it's he's, he's a fun guy to hang around anyway. So nice to see you here. And then we got everybody's got to make a living. Yeah, well, <laughs> ain't that the truth? And then uh, Robert um, Alloy is um, is the uh, well, you know, pseudonym. We know who he really is. Yeah, triple rabbi. Triple rabbi. 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 Well, well you both right for once. And I, I <laughs> Well, I wanted to, to see who's going to show up today, say hello, but we got to get going because we have a, we have an important uh, meeting with a client. Yeah, we do have to see a client. We couldn't, uh, this is kind of an urgent case. We'll reveal what this case is about probably in season three coming up. If we're able to shoot it, we just started our crowdfunding campaign today. So we'll see about that. 
the person in real life, we've got to meet the client and we cannot be late for this meeting. No, it's important that we that we show up. Yeah, it's a, and not be late because she's a looker. Okay, so we're at, see you later. I think in the meantime, um, this guy, Jonathan, if he's still hanging around here, we'll tell him uh, he could come say hello to you because he would mean a lot to him because it makes him feel like he's actually part of this. <laughs> okay, so um, nice to see everybody. And we'll catch nice up with you later. To see you, boss. So long. See you later. See you later. Gentlemen, <laughs> my best. Oh, that lady has such a raving, roving eye. He's always looking after the girls. So would you like you lot like to go around, introduce your name and what you do? That's why Jonathan's off screen. Sure. I'll start if anyone no one else if anyone yeah. minds. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yeah. I'm Gregory Levine. Uh thespian of some repute, do character comedy in cabarets, and have a bunch of artists and reprehensible criminals all over my bloodline. So uh, I thought this was a neat way to merge little tribute to my ancestry. Saw the casting post for this, looked at the web series, and thought I, I have to be in it. This this is destiny. Blackmail, awesome. bribery, whatever it takes. That's really cool to hear. Um, Christopher? Yeah, Chris Torum. Um, so, AKA Goose. Um, I was, uh, I live in Rhode Island. I'm actually a school psychologist and um, I used to be an uh, adjunct professor uh, at uh, the local college. But um, I rekindled my acting career uh, after I, I, I was uh, very sick. I was in ICU and I have Crohn's disease and, and I um, uh, was about a 50-50 shot of, of living. Uh, think of me with 80 pounds less uh, on me. Okay. So uh, I'm looking at law and order and I said, yeah, I could do that if I could just get back to one thing. And so one thing led to another and I've really enjoyed it. A uh, funny story about when I did the audition, I was five hours late because um, of traffic and I, you know, miscalculated and there was an accident and whatnot. I park in a school zone illegally. I run up because I didn't want to pull a no-show. Yeah. I step in mud up until my uh, knees. I walk in, read the script once, did two takes, and that was in season one. Um, okay. They said that, yeah, this is the part that they wanted and uh, uh, for me. And, and, and I was really honored. And then they brought me back in, in a little bit of an expanded role in season two. And uh, it was absolutely great great people to work with uh the one thing i remember is like when you're working with the other actors they made it so easy to just do your character yeah which is not always the case family atmosphere as well awesome that's really cool to her I'm glad. great team um josephine you guys go next sure josephine pizzino here i play mrs lustig in season two i'm hoping to do some more jonathan <laughs> I'm, I'm working I'm, on it. I'm currently also working with Rising Sun Performance Company, and we have a live Zoom show coming up March 13th and 14th, Rites of Spring. Uh, I also do murder mysteries via Zoom that are shown in colleges across the U.S. and in the U.K. Oh, cool. So, yeah. I've been keeping busy, surprisingly busy during this weird virtual living space yeah. thing that we're all in. <laughs> nice, that's good to hear. Um, Robert, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, uh, my name is Robert Alloy. I play Rabbi, Rabbi, Rabbi. Try saying that five times fast. <laughs> uh, born and raised in Brooklyn, New York, and still living there. I'm uh, just your average quirky character actor. Been doing this now for over 10 years, with some little sporadic breaks in between, just to avoid burnout. But I've pretty much done it all, from just like ancient uh, Greek tragedy comedy to like Shakespeare and uh, absurdist theater. Uh, to just all the way to contemporary um, 
comedy and dramas, you know, uh, the 20th century. And I was, my main focus for a long while was theater. And I just made the jump to film as of two or three years ago, just to pursue it more seriously. And here I am. And I just happened to come across this audition for it. And I knew right away that I was such a right fit for this part that I thought that it would have been almost criminal for me not to get this. <laughs> but I'm very, very grateful and such a great team, very uh, family oriented atmosphere. And I couldn't be with uh, with better people, to be honest. So I'm blessed. That's one. That's really cool to us. Um, I had the scene with Robert and he just made it so easy to do my role. I remember practicing and, you know, obviously there's a little bit of anxiety with that, no matter how many times you do it. And he just made it so easy. It was, it, it, he, I was an honor to work with him. I wish I worked. Thank you. Likewise, likewise. Uh, Mark, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Mark Lovers. I was uh, honored to be in episode one of season two as Rabbi Schmutzik Pupik. Um, I'm uh, coming to you from Pennsylvania by way of Long Island, New York, uh, my upbringing. Um, I, uh, two things, I have a plug because I have a, another web series coming out in the next week or so called The drive Through Therapist. Uh, that's easy enough to find and that'll be fun. And the other thing is I have a funny audition story as well. I was so... Uh, uh, uptight about not getting on the show that I didn't want to reschedule my initial Zoom interview. The callbacks were live, but if the first thing was on, on the Zoom. Yeah. So I uh, didn't want to tell uh, Jonathan and Kat that I was on vacation with my family on the beach. So here I was sun sunburnt and salt smelling, trying to get myself into the New York City rabbi state of mind uh, uh, doing this audition. And uh, luckily it panned out. That's really good to her. Nice. Um, Joe, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hey, thanks for the opportunity. Now, th this was great, the opportunity to work on Trello and Suede. I'm actually, my, back, my background actually is in radio, so I've enjoyed encouraging performances from the opposite side of the thing as a producer. Where I've been blessed with the opportunity to work with a number of celebrities and DJs over the course of producing radio ads in my career. And oh, nice. uh, I had transitioned to acting about three years ago, but before that I did a lot of non-scripted things. I've been lucky enough to be cast in six game shows for being a, a quirky Jewish guy from Brooklyn <laughs> and uh, was lucky enough to be on one of the earlier seasons of The Amazing Race, uh, oh, wow. season six of The Amazing Race back in the day. And they actually cast me in part because I vowed to keep kosher on the race. So oh. anytime you can get like Jewish themed projects, you don't see those every day on, on backstage. So, yeah. uh, so it was a really, really great natural fit to do. And, uh, you know, Jonathan, it was, it was a real, those were fun, fun characters. I love doing celebrity impressions and it was fun doing the John Elwood based on John Edwards, who my act, who a very good friend of mine actually worked with. He was his cameraman for a number of years, so I was able to get a lot of insight. And growing up in Brooklyn, you know, that makes you an expert on Guidos, if nothing else, you know. Oh. So that's going to be trippy. And a, a little little plug, um, I was blessed to be at last Friday. I was in the number two trending video on all of YouTube. Uh, I was lucky enough to be cast in Zach, Zach Snyder's upcoming Army of the Dead, uh, oh. Netflix's first big budget oh, action oh, popcorn nice. franchise. And, uh, and and you can very clearly see me in the trailer. You're looking at wait for this zombie Elvis. <laughs> wow. 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 That's amazing. Wow. It, it, Love it. Zombie Elvis. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, last but not least, before we go on to Jonathan, Dave Polger. Hello, everyone. Hi, Dave. You want to introduce yourself? Hi. Sorry, sorry, I'm late to the party. Um, yeah, uh, so I guess uh, we're just introducing ourselves. Yeah. Um, yeah, cool. So yeah, I'm, I'm Dave Polgar. Uh, I played uh, Schlepp um, in season one, and then uh, Schlepp, Stoys, Still. Am I missing anything, Jonathan? Schlug. In season Schlug. two. Schlug. Yeah. Schlug, yes. Uh, aliases of the same cal character. Exactly, yeah. Uh, and really, I mean, I, I don't remember exactly how I, you know, submitted. It was probably casting networks or actors access for the for the uh, for the role. And um, when I 
when I got the sides, I immediately started thinking of like vaudeville. And um, I've been fortunate enough. I, I, I overheard someone say that they've been doing murder mysteries. Um, I'm actually working with a, a theater company that we've actually been doing shows in person. Uh, it's very small crowds, obviously like private residences, but we've been fortunate enough to do live shows. And all we do is vaudeville. It's just, you know, you think of the old, the classics, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy. I mean, that's what Riddles Brood Theater Company does. Um, and when Jonathan sent me the sides, I was like, this is right up my alley. And um, <laughs> meeting Jonathan and then seeing him work, obviously getting into his, you know, Trillo and Suede, it's just, obviously it, it's taken years. I'm sure you can attest to this, Jonathan, but but just the how, how on he is and just the timing. And you don't see that a lot with like the ventriloquist that, that you see it's usually like, you know, <laughs> at least what I've seen is that the puppeteer and I apologize, Jonathan, and to all of those ventriloquists, if, if I use a, a term that, that is uncouth or, or in bad taste, it's because of my ignorance. So the pup, the puppeteer, how do, what do you call yourselves, Jonathan? Well, you mean other than ventriloquist or just ventriloquist? Okay. There it is. So <laughs> <laughs> the ones that I, that I've seen, it's, you know, um, Usually the, 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 the puppet is the clown. I, I think, and, and again, I, just the way I see Jonathan do it, he is the clown. And, and again, just working with him and being able to spit, you know, riffing, obviously sticking to the script, but, but having that um, liberty, so to speak, to, to just play around with the characters and, and, you know, just playing off of him and, and everyone else that I've worked with. I mean, Chris, I mean, we worked together in, in uh, season one, but, you know, all, all of the actors that I got a chance to work with even more so on season two, it's just been, it's been a blast. Nice. It's really cool to hear. Awesome. Uh, and last but not least, obviously, the creator, Jonathan. Yes. Well, where should I begin? I don't want to um, take away. I, I want to give opportunities for more discussion and more reactions or, from everybody here. So, um, uh, what uh, what would you most like to know, Adam? Um, I'd like to know everyone's favorite 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 moment from being part of the show. Oh, <laughs> boy, that that really is tough for me because these um, I was very pleased, very happy with uh, with all the cast, and um, I mean everyone here, and even the ones who couldn't make it here today. Um, there's really nobody who disappointed me uh, as an actor. I was very happy with, with how everybody uh, did their roles and also the work ethic and attitude was, was very uh, positive, uh, you know, helped to create a nice atmosphere, helped to mitigate a bit against the, the stress of the situation, my stress. I don't know uh, what stress others might've felt, but you know, I had a lot of stress because it was, it's my project. It's my money. I was bankrolling this whole thing, first season and second season. Uh, so I had a lot riding on it. And um, there were all kinds of things that were um, problems, little or smaller, uh, I mean, smaller and larger problems cropping up with production. And uh, I, I can talk forever about that. I don't want to bore people with all these stories, but just things that, that don't go right with, with equipment, rentals, and locations um, and, um, and crew members too. Uh, we had some problems with people um, who uh, weren't last minute um, you vanished and, uh, or could not do it for one reason or another. Okay. And there are various problems like that and things going wrong as we were shooting it. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, that's the stuff that I had to deal with because I didn't want to involve the actors with, uh, with those kind of problems. But yeah, but it was on my mind a lot and the time pressure is getting behind schedule. It was a very tight shoot. Uh, yeah. I was trying to do it as quickly as possible because time is money, it's all my money. So I, I would have loved to have more time, more days for each of the seasons to, uh, to be more leisurely about it, but I didn't have that luxury. So I had to make the best out of a difficult situation. And thanks to my cast here, in large part, thanks to them, 
it went as well as can be expected, better than I expected it would be. The, and, and to the point where after editing, post-production and all that, I'm really quite pleased with, uh, with the results. That's really good to hear. Um, yeah, so from every actor who's here, um, could you say one favorite moment from the season that you were part of? Well, you know, Jonathan mentioned uh, the location shots. And yeah. that, that day that we were in Flushing Meadow Park was just so, everything about it was exquisite. Mm -hmm. It was the perfect, absolutely perfect day. We had plenty of room to spread out and, you know, not breathe on each other. And it was just, you know, com compared to where we had been all of those months of being locked up and everything, it just felt so liberating and so wonderful. And it, it just really, you know, it didn't, it didn't even feel like a long day. It just felt like, oh, I could, I could be here another 10 Absolutely. hours. You know, it's just so glorious out here. We got lucky. Yeah. We did. That was a beautiful day. Mm. Uh, Mark. Yeah. yeah, I have one. Uh, actually, my favorite moment is a blooper. Um, and it's yeah. a funny one. Uh, because when you're acting and you're doing this, whether it's on screen or on the stage, uh, and something goes awry, a mistake is made, there's a vibration among the group as, as to whether or not we should actually stop, you know, is it something that we can ac actually accept and keep going? Because, you know, Jonathan mentioned the tight shoot, and, you know, maybe this is something we can keep, And but even though we know it didn't go quite so perfectly. So um, uh, there was a young man named Jonathan, uh, uh, Hassan Farrow played uh, uh, Rabbi Lustig, and uh, he uh, had a line where he said that he became Jewish so people wouldn't know that he was black. Um, and he's an African-American. And, and that's the joke. And the, the, the blooper was that he got the line backwards, that I became black so nobody would know I was Jewish. And the, but that's not the funny part. The funny part is that the vibration between all of us was like, should we keep going? I don't think we can keep that. That, that That's not going to work. So we all stopped and laughed and and it was an interesting kind of acting moment because everyone shared the vibration of, was that a mistake that we can accept and keep going? Just, nah, let's just stop and get it right. Yeah, that's um, um, that that was a, a high point in the shoot. Now that you remind me about that, and it's on the blooper reel. I have a, a compilation of bloopers um, that I put together that you can see on our YouTube channel. And uh, I don't know if you've all seen it or not, but it's it's fun to to watch. Adam, you'll probably get a kick out of that. I think anyone would because uh, bloopers like that. But that's that's probably my favorite blooper also. That was really um, just uh, took everybody by surprise in just the right way. So it was yeah, it was really refreshing. It was like a bucket of cold water, and it just let's just it let everybody breathe and get back into the rhythm of things. Yeah. In fact, that's the last blooper I remember now in my edit of the, the bloopers from the, the shoot. I ended with that one. <laughs> So uh, in the compilation. Yep. Um, Christopher, what's your favorite, one of your favorite moments on the show? So when you said that, I, I spent um, hours sewing a rip away bouncer outfit. Uh, and underneath I had a, uh, a, a pink bikini on. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, I thought of that one, but I, I, I said, no, I that it had to be me coming out of the closet uh, with a princess dress and uh, Jessica uh, Rabbi um, with thigh-high boots, thigh-high nylons, uh, some of my old biker wear chains. And, and like Robert, she made it so easy for me to do my lines. I was very impressed. And I mean, I don't, you don't know me that well, but I wouldn't say that if it wasn't true. I'm, I'm sometimes I get in trouble for telling the truth um, <laughs> when asked questions. But she really made it easy. I had, to, you know, uh, Mistress uh, Jessica, and she's like, "Yeah, go dance around the room, not a problem." Um, made it so easy. And 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 you know, with, as far as you know, Jonathan and the ventriloquist act I, I really never like i think of him as two people when i was doing the shoot he's so good it's yeah. amazing i've seen it yeah it's amazing yeah. Uh, so, thank you i appreciate it. 
Uh, Mark, what's your favourite moment from this season that you're part of? Can you hear me? I covered, uh, I covered mine. Mine was the oh, Bloopers. Oh, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, Robert, sorry. We'll go, Robert. <laughs> oh, wow. That's a very good question. Um, I think one of my favorite moments of the show is um, just being able to be in, in the moment itself. And what I mean by that is given the style of the humor and how out there the characters and the style and the storyline is, it made room for improvisation. Like I felt like as a performer, one of the things I like, and this is why I love comedy in general, is because while you have the dialogue and you have to stick to it, of course, because you got to respect the writer. Yeah. But at the same time, when you have something that's so out there, it's so quirky and oddball as this, you get to play with it too. Like you get to like uh, emphasize things and you get to, um, you know, even like exaggerate things even more given the style of the humor and how you could just play with more. Like, it just it just came across as very, very, um, like, Commedia del art for me at some point. Yeah. Like, that old, like, uh, Italian-style improvisation where, you know, characters are drawn out and everything. And I think that just kind of, like, added to the comfort. Like, it just made me feel like I had a sense of ownership to the character that I was playing. And I'm sure everybody else must have felt that way because, you know, I mean, because you know, lots of times when you're doing like uh, just straight up drama, it's very dry and you kind of have to stick to like one mode of thinking. But here, no, it was just like, I just felt like with every take I was always playing and I was always trying something. And the fact that I was getting encouragement from Jonathan and the other people as well, just made it even more fulfilling and gave me much more confidence. And I saw that in everybody else. And that just made me feel like I was part of a team. I was part of something more than just being part of a show. This was like a happening, if that makes sense. Yeah, I totally get you. That's really cool. Yeah, and you know, that's something I noticed in everybody in the auditions that uh, everybody was good at improvising, ad-libbing. And uh, that's one of the things I was looking for too. Uh, I knew there wouldn't be much room for it because of the time restraints, but I, I wanted to know that people had that ability because then even if they're just sticking to the, the lines, there's, it gives a sort of a freedom, um, you know, just the fact that I know they're able to improvise it, that, that even the way they do the lines um, could would be something refreshing, something that I didn't even think of, they might add to it, you know? So, um, and that's exactly what happened. Even though I would have loved to to have time for more takes of everything and let everybody really uh, improvise more, but we had very little, you know, know that we uh, had very little of that, very little time for that. So there wasn't much of that, but uh, even in the way the lines were delivered, there's an improvisatory feel which uh, was important to me and everybody was great at that. Awesome. Uh, so Dave, do you want to go next and say what your favorite Yeah, moment? sure. Um, really, I, I, I'm having a really tough time thinking of one specific thing. Um, this is more general, but it, it's just, just the way that, you know, um, the dynamic that each, and this, this goes back to what people have said about, you know, just being able to play and, and just being so free and, and willing to, to just, you know, accept anything that, that is created. And, and it's just the dynamic really between each, each character. And obviously Tr Trillo and Suede is at, is at the precipice of it, but, but, you know, Trillo and Suede, they, they, they in encounter every character because they're, it's, <laughs> it, they're the title character. Yeah. But the dynamic that the other characters have with one another, and again, going back to people have mentioned improv, but just, just you know, having that that just uncanny ability to to play and, and create on the fly. And again, goes back to improv, ad-libbing, whatever you want to call it, just being that free and open. It really just created such a cool dynamic. And and again, Jonathan said this, and, I, and you know, th this is the one thing that, you know, I... I'm a fan because, you know, I'm a fan of acting <laughs> but and the genre, but but just the fact that these are like the episodes are so quick, you know, 10, 12 minutes out of your day. It's just like, boom. And, and you know, you got to keep up. It's it's that type of snappy, snippety humor. It's it's not the dry humor that, that someone mentioned. 
And, and again, it, it's, it's just when you stop and think, you know, you're like, oh, wait a minute. That was really funny. Oh, wait a minute. I'm, I'm, I'm losing it because you're, you're thinking about a joke. But, you know, Trulero and Suede are already five steps ahead of you. It's just, it's great. Yeah. I could go on and on. Sorry. Yeah, that's really cool. Oh. That's really cool to hear. Nice. <laughs> uh, so, Gregory, next, would you like to go? Uh, yeah, I'm going gonna, gonna to parrot a lot of what everyone said already. Okay. Uh, the the ridiculousness of the writing, the like beautiful ridiculousness of the writing, the, the vaudeville silliness of it taken deadly seriously and the opportunity to scream like a psychopath at a ventriloquist dummy and, and play it as it, it's happening. This is actually something that's happening in this insane universe. Yeah. Willow and Suede and everyone else live in and uh, the fact that all of this is happening and the production values are gorgeous, like almost ridiculously beautiful. And mm -hmm. having that framework, I don't remember, I can't remember the name of your actress who did the opera singing, but to see her actually belt out professionally and then break into a scream because a murder happened. And like, that moment was like so beautifully ridiculous because she took it absolutely seriously and it was hysterical. And likewise, having uh, uh, Katarina Schmidt, who's not here with us today, we have a scene where I'm supposed to be threatening her. And while they were setting up another shoot, she just started like throwing the words at me in slightly different order. Like, I don't, like she was testing and playing. Oh, okay. like, oh we're doing this, we're doing this now. <laughs> and we just started zipping it back and forth and it was our own little insane universe while the rest of it was happening and just nice. yeah yeah it was awesome yes emily solo is the uh, the yeah. opera singer so. and uh yeah I, I remember that when we were shooting uh that scene that you're referring to with uh, uh katarina uh, and um I, I saw how um you guys uh ad-libbed a bit and i was thinking to myself oh I, i'd love to play with this more and uh you know, see else what else you can come up with uh but we you know again we didn't have much time for it but just the fact that you had that chemistry between you added a lot to the little bit of interaction that you had it really brought it to life a lot yeah you gave us so much to, i'm sorry for going on again but i'm thinking of like when we did the entrance robert and i like over getting it just right and getting the the steps right and it was like we had this little dynamic of him being my my mob toady and it was just so much like to me i hate i don't love broad humor that's done too broadly when people are just like not just throwing it around but the fact that yeah yeah we're, we're doing this we're actually doing this ridiculousness for real mm -hmm. well it's clear from listening to all of your experiences just uh, reinforces what i knew already that you you all were just right for your for your roles and to participate in general um in this because that's what i was looking for in audition in the auditioning that actors who who get it to understand that I, I don't have to do too much explaining of uh, uh, about what's going on or what i'm going for you all seem to sense it right away and understand it right away and that that was very important uh, because I, I don't think everybody uh would appreciate or does appreciate this kind of humor and, and also i'm doing I'm doing something which is quite unique also. It's not like I didn't invent humor or, or even the general genre, but the, this uh, ventriloquist and his dummy as detectives in a film noirish universe, which is an alternate universe uh, combined with uh, modern um, anachronisms and uh, all that stuff going on at once. You know, that I think really is pretty unique. And uh, I, I wanted, I needed actors who could step into that world right away and. Uh, and appreciate and feel that that sensibility that I'm going for that and the absurdist humor and part of it one of you mentioned um forget who is important it was important it is important about the fact that um, I needed um, actors who could play it straight um like play it for real but also with the quirkiness of their characters coming through but not going for the laughs you know a lot not like quote, trying to be funny, um, letting the material, my, my scripts, as well as the absurdity, absurdity of the whole uh, universe there, and the quirkiness of their characters, let that all create the humor, but, you know, without, like, being um, jokey, uh, that kind of thing. But 
I didn't really have to, I thought maybe I'd have to spend more time sort of explain, but everybody understood right away. That's awesome. Um, so I want to throw out to the group, anyone can answer this. What's something you'd like to see in season three going forward from your characters or in the story in general? I have no idea because I'm not going to learn how to operate a boom mic. <laughs> yeah. I think I'd like to see Swade perhaps be a bit more vulnerable because he's always so tough and confident and wisecracky. It might be interesting to see him again because he's so interested in women. Perhaps have a little hesitation or confusion, maybe even something to do with gender. <laughs> hey, you never know. It's oh. 2021. <laughs> you know, goes. maybe like a, 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 another puppet creature that isn't uh, binary. Sounds good. Sounds good. <laughs> okay, I'm going to make notes. We would actually that. defer to uh, one of Jonathan's other passions that he's spoken about, which is the Marx Brothers. And, you know, you can't go wrong when you pay homage to the Marx Brothers. And whether you do an episode that's maybe a duck soup or a night at the opera, or if you could really, uh, from Jonathan's perspective, take what it is you're the most, if you could go back in time and create an actual Marx Brothers film or production, using the Marx Brothers, and you've been doing that now, I, I would love to see a full-on Marx Brothers homage, you know, paying tribute to the greatness that was their comedy. Yeah, that'd be really cool. Nice. One thing that crossed my mind was, and I know this is going to sound really bizarre and out there, but I think would be kind of fun, is that if you had, like, more sort of, like, musical interludes, you know, like, moments where, like, if people just broke out into song together, and they don't have to be, like, real actual singers. Like, I think part of the comedy would be that the fact that they can't really sing, but, like, you know, the fact of the matter is that the songs themselves, whatever it is, you know, like, that could be one one idea, you know what I mean? Like, um you know, just like something like like a special like ode to like I don't know like Broadway or something like that. <laughs> musical, a Troll and Swade musical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like just like I said, just like I mean, um, <laughs> um, people, like the musical buffs out there, and and kind of like include them maybe. I don't know. Well, it's an idea. It reminds me of uh, a Woody Allen movie that I didn't see. I I heard about it, never saw it. I don't know the name of it. Do you know what I'm referring to? He did a, a musical maybe a decade ago or oh, something. Oh, everyone that's, says I love you. Oh yeah. Do, do you see that? Anybody see that? Yeah, yeah. So was it kind yeah, of like that? Was it uh, how how they play it? How did he play it? Was it uh, from what I read about it? I think it was like it was the actors who who couldn't sing well. All yeah. right. Yeah, and they you, would but they were playing it straight, like they were really you know trying yeah. to do it. Or something. Was it like that? Yeah, how yeah. Did, did they were giving it their all. Yeah, do you think that that worked? I think it did. I yeah. think it did. I think the bravado really just carried it. Their sincerity. Yeah. Well, it's an idea. Dolls and dolls. <laughs> I would love to see how Trillo and Suede became partners. Like maybe they met during the war. Maybe they were in the same oh, foxhole yeah. and Suede saved Trillo's life for aid. Okay. Yeah, that's really cool. Hmm. So, Adam, you know, when you asked that question, and I seem to have an opinion on everything, but nothing came to mind. I, I was like, whatever Jonathan is going to come up with, and, and I love the ideas. And I also want you to know that um, this is the only comedy thing I've ever done. I play villains, bikers. Bugs. This is the only comedy uh, that I've ever done. I loved doing it. Um, and, uh, you know, people in my, that know me think that I have good, uh, you know, spontaneity and whatever. But um, uh, no, that, so actually nothing came to mind, but I can't wait to, to see what he comes up with next. Nice. Uh, so, Christy, you said on that note, it was your first comedy. So what attracted yeah. you to the role? Um, well, I remember reading the script and... Uh, it said uh, that you're uh, uh, kind of a 
a thug bouncer thief type. So I, I, that's the first thing. I mean, if I see on Actors Access, you know, a uh, handsome socialite upclass delete, you know, <laughs> that, forget that. Um, <laughs> that's just not me. But um, and and uh, 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 dumb with a sensitive side, and I can play dumb. And sometimes, in the, depending on the situation, I'm very dumb. Uh, but uh, I, I do have that, you know, sensitive thug side dynamic so um i i gave that a shot for that reason not that i would you know not bid on the comedy i just again it's russian villain thug biker villain uh, psychopath type of roles that i do um most okay cool nice um so how did the rest of you come across the um role that you got uh, start with josephine I'm sorry, I had a hard time hearing you just now. Uh, how did you come across the role? Oh, backstage. I answered an ad in backstage. Right. And uh, uh, there was, I think, two auditions, if I remember correctly. Right. Uh, and I remember studying really, really hard to try to get the accent right, um, because it's a totally different world from mine. However, I live in a neighborhood where there are lots of Hasidic people. Um, and so I had the physicality of it. I felt that came easy. Yeah. It was the accent and, oh, Jonathan helped me so much with the Yiddish words that I <laughs> kept screwing up, but um, he was very patient <laughs> and helpful with all of that. That's really good. We had uh, a different, uh, Mrs. Mrs. Lustig, her character, uh, we had a different one in season one, um, and she was uh, lined up to continue in season two. Um, you know, I was pleased with her and her role, uh, but it was kind of last minute. Um, oh, I was, there was some issues about this, that she might not be available. So then I did put out the casting call as backup. So first, I don't know if you know this, uh, Josephine, at first when I, the casting call, it was only as a backup because I wasn't confident that she'd be available. So I want to have someone, uh, I, I kind of, I had this suspicion, a sneaking suspicion that she might just back out at the last minute. And, uh, and that's exactly what happened. So, uh, you know, I auditioned uh, for perspective of Mrs. Listings in case that happened. And it did happen. So meanwhile, you were my... Uh, <laughs> the top of my list as, the, as the, a replacement. And, uh, you know, whenever it was, I, uh, I don't remember when I notified, but it was shortly before the shoot, wasn't it? Uh, a few days before or something. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's what, um, and that's what happened. So I was very relieved that you were uh, available and very happy that you, uh, that you took over the role. And uh, yeah, the, the accent, the Yiddish accent was the only thing, the pronunciation of the words that, uh, I knew you'd need a little help with, but uh, I still wanted you uh, to do it because you were uh, you were the best overall of uh, the ones that I uh, interviewed. I, I there were, uh, I auditioned a couple of uh, women who who were Jewish and had a good Yiddish accent too, but they didn't. In other ways, they didn't uh, play it uh, as well as you did. So I decided I'll, I'll go with you, give you a little coaching on the Yiddish, and uh, it worked out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, how about yourself, Joe? How did you come across the role? I have to say, uh, again, answering the ad and backstage, um, prepping for the initial audition was fun for two reasons. And that uh, one of my dearest, dearest friends to this day since college, my friend Evans Coates, were one of the relatively too few people who were able to make a transition and stay in the TV or radio industry since we were taking classes. He's actually a very accomplished camera person. And as I mentioned a bit earlier, he was one of John Edwards's, the real life TV psychic on whom John Elwood is, is based. Uh, okay. He was one of his camera people for many, many years. And John uh, Edward actually did an actual surprise reading on him during an episode. And it wound up really changing his life and getting a lot of, you know, helping him cope with a number of, of, of situations he was dealing with. So. It was kind of cool just for me to be able to prep for the John Elwood role to be able to call upon a, a lifelong friend in my adult life yeah. and be able to say, hey, tell me everything about John Edward. Trust me, no quirk is too small. I've got to nail this guy. 
and you know, like you know, long after college ended, to be able to collaborate with a college buddy on something regarding TV and video production was just super cool to do and to do. And I, I was really appreciative to Jonathan uh, also for the opportunity to improv during the audition so that I could do a riff on kosher delis and all the quirks about them that, uh, you know, that, that I like, I would hope set me aside from the rest of the audition. Years, so. Yeah, that was one thing that set you aside. The, the improv was great. As I mentioned, I would have loved to, uh, to actually have more time to improv when we were shooting, but we were just uh, behind the eight ball with, with schedule. We were, we were already behind schedule then, and um, no time for, for that really. But uh, I knew that you uh, that you could do it. And uh, I mean, if we had the time, and as I also mentioned, just the fact that you were able to improv in character gave a lot to the role, even though we stuck to the script. We, you know, we really stuck to the script when we shot it, but you had that improvisatory, um, real quality. It made it seem all the more real because it, uh, you know, it, it bleeds into the actual reading of lines when you don't really have to stick to lines, you know, that, that kind of thing. Well, as, as Rabbi Shmutzik Pupik would say, Todah Rabbi, Jonathan. <laughs> that's, that's, thank you very much in Hebrew. So. Welcome. And then um, Joe wound up being cast also as Bishop the Bouncer in the last Exit Nightclub. That was, um, uh, I don't know if I ever told you this either. That was last minute thing because we had someone else lined up. A cat, the director, had a friend who was going to play that. I didn't even know who it was, uh, but uh, uh, until like, uh, you know, it's close to shooting, but she um, then she had this guy lined up for it. So, oh, don't, don't worry, he'll be great for the role or whatever. And then it got very close to the, I think we actually started to shoot. I don't remember when we finally contacted you, but it was, it was not much um, lead time. And uh, then she, she told me one day, oh, this guy can't make it, whoever is it. So that, uh, we didn't even cast for anybody. So uh, then I was thinking of something you had told me, you had asked me when you auditioned, I don't know if it was at the first or second audition or yeah, exactly. an email correspondence. You said, uh, uh, hey, you ever uh, cast someone for more than one role? Uh, and uh, uh, then I was thinking, um, you know, something you could play both. You, you could play, you'd be great for that. So we just said, okay, hey, I'm giving you this role too. And you were great for it. That was a, and that was a fun scene from a production point of view to see you turn a synagogue into a nightclub was that that was that was pretty trippy. That was some great product. That was that was a great aspect of production. Yeah. Agreed. Yep. Uh, so, Mark, would you like to say how you got into Jonathan's show? Well, it was the same thing. I don't remember which of the. Uh, uh, want to add websites uh, I even went through, but it was the same kind of process. Oh, I already told my story about uh, the initial audition, so that, uh, that was what it was, but it's still pretty special. Um, yeah, and as I think it was Gregory mentioned earlier on, once I, I did uh, get the feel that I was actually being seriously considered, I, I uh, took the time to watch through all of season one, and I said, yeah, I got to be a part of this. It, 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 it can't not happen. Awesome. Uh, <laughs> so, Jonathan, how did you go about? Um, what was it like working with all these um, cast members? Well, they were all great to work with, which made the whole thing doable because of the uh, various stresses and pressures that I was feeling at getting the shoot done. So, uh, if that wasn't the case, I don't know how I could have done it. If the actors weren't as good as they all were. So um, that's something that was a, a great relief. Uh, season one, oh, oh, we had um, uh, d different actors, uh, mostly, but there are a couple of carryovers. And then we had um, uh, season two. Now, going into season three, people have alluded to this. Uh, first of all, it's going to most likely be an abbreviated season. And it's not 100% that we're actually going to be able to do it. Um, because the first two seasons I self-funded because it was my bucket list, top of the bucket list of what I wanted to do in my career that I wasn't able, for two decades, I've been trying to find ways to, to produce versions of Trillo and Slade, feature films that I wrote, five of them in total, feature films of um, 
with uh, Trillo and Suede. And lots of stories I could go into about how I almost got things produced, uh, it seems, a number of times, and the deals always fell through uh, or producers disappeared or whatever. So it just, it never happened. So it was a great disappointment to me. Uh, TV shows too. There, there, were, there were times it seemed I was close to getting a deal with uh, a couple of different places, TV studios. The, the very first one was Sky TV in England, in the UK. Oh, I mentioned that in our other interview, Adam, right? Sky TV. Yeah, they were one of my first rejections back in the year 2000. I remember uh, they, the um, person in charge of development at Sky TV wrote me a, a letter, an email saying that it was, uh, you know, that how much she, she loved oh, yes. my submission, the script for this. And uh, I submitted my first feature film, in this case, as a made for TV movie or first episode in um, like a double episode in a series. And uh, she said she loved it and it was great, et cetera, but it doesn't quite fit what they're looking for or whatever. Uh, so it was a, a very nice rejection. But anyway, that's one of uh, what turned out to be many such disappointments along the way. So eventually, fast forward to 2019 is when I decided that I'm going to do my own web series. I figured I, I was thinking of doing one of the feature films, but uh, how much money it would take. The web series at least wouldn't cost as much as a feature film, even low budget. So I figured that's what I'll do. I did season one. And the critical success very quickly was really great. I, we, I submitted it to film festivals around the world and, and started winning a lot of them. Nice. And so I uh, was encouraged, even though it was a difficult slog to, and still is to get to, to build up the, uh, the fan base. But still, since so many people seem to deem it worthy of awards and the small numbers of fans that were gathering to my YouTube channel, a lot of them were very enthusiastic and also to my Facebook group as when I created that a little later. So it made me decide, okay, I'm going to fund another one, dig into my own pockets and do a season two. Hopefully that's going to lead to something. But, and I, so here we are and it has not led to the kind of uh, notoriety that I would have hoped for, especially after winning so many contests. So that is a disappointment at the moment. But uh, since I have so much critical acclaim and I have a small core of very enthusiastic fans, so I still believe that there is a lot of potential for this to go a lot further. So uh, that's why I really want to do season three. But I've reached the end of my self-funding. So this will not happen unless... I get it funded. And the only way that I can see right now in the near future is crowdfunding. And that's why just today, by coincidence, I launched a crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo. Uh, and this will only be for, uh, uh, for an abbreviated season, a half season, really, five episodes rather than 10. Because I was thinking what I would need for a full 10 episode season three based on what it cost me for season two is about $35,000. And that's on a very tight budget because, you know, because I aim for good production value. And I think I did, especially season two had really good production value for this type of thing. And so that, that isn't really cheap, you know? So that's why $35,000 is, uh, is a very tight budget to, to do that. And, um, and I don't have the confidence that crowdfunding will get me that based on the size of my fan base right now. Uh, and so I decided I'll set the goal. You have to set some sort of goal. And so my goal is $18,000. And that would be for the purpose of shooting the five episodes. So that's what I'm hoping for. Built into it and in my explanation about the, uh, on the crowdfunding campaign is that if we exceed our budget, that's great. And then I could do maybe more episodes. Yeah. If we go way over budget, maybe I could do the whole... 10 but i'm not i'm not counting on that if we're under if we uh, fall short it depends how how far we fall short um i might just do one or two episodes and then keep looking for funding to complete uh, or continue with season three or if it's really far falls far short maybe instead of season three it will just be a, a short and basically basically it might just be 
episode one that I shoot and just that won't even call it a season a part of season just it'll be a, a short so I'll get something out there but I'll use whatever money I can uh, fundraise here in this campaign to do something and it's shooting in June so I would love to bring back all our cast from season two into season three but right now it's very up in the air first of all whether we will have a season three mm-hmm. and second if we do how many episodes how many of, of, of all of these characters I can get into it. Uh, so I will do my best to bring everybody back if possible. Awesome. So obviously you said season three you might not go ahead, but how far would you like to go with Trill and Wade if money goes well, if you can do everything? Yeah, well, I'd like this to continue, the web series indefinitely, to continue doing uh, seasons of Trill and Wade, if nothing else. But I have to see an ongoing way that that can be funded. Hopefully, the YouTube channel can get monetized before too long. I'm not at the level where I can, where I can monetize it yet. But if I can do that and sell merchandise, that it would have to pick up a lot. You know, be able yeah. to sell a lot. Have to pick it, be able to sell a lot of merchandise. But I'm hoping it will, it will grow, um, you know, exponentially before too long, and I will have a source of funding through through that to continue. But also, I would love to have a bigger series on one of the networks, you know, Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, or any other network, HBO. Hey, I'll settle for Showtime. Whatever. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'd love to have a series. But that also, I don't know how I can do that at this point because they're not approachable, Those um, all those channel stations. Uh, you know, unless you have an agent who's in the business already it's a cash 22 right i have not been able to find an agent to represent me who's in that circle who has access to pitch projects to any of those big places so uh, right now that can't be done they I, i was hoping that after winning so many contests they would notice me that hasn't happened yet um one problem with that is that i haven't been able to enter the biggest of the contests i've I've entered and won a lot of small and mid-sized contests because the most famous ones, the ones where that is more likely to happen, that people come searching for me and asking me, uh, those have requirements. I didn't even realize at the time that it all has always has to be a world premiere. And uh, so uh, I tried to submit to Sundance, Cannes Festival, um, what else, Tribeca, um, a couple other ones that are big, but all of them have that same policy as I found out afterwards that they just reject it. We're not going to, we don't accept your submission because your web series is, is on the web. I said, well, isn't that where web series is supposed to be on the web? <laughs> it's like, so, yeah, but no, not for their rules are that whatever you're submitting, uh, feature film, short film, web series, that <clears throat> you have to have withheld it from the public and they make it just wait and see if you win their contest so that they could announce it's a world premiere. So that's finished. I can't do it anymore. <laughs> can't oh, submit wow. to any of those big festivals. Uh, that's a shame, that. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to ask one last thing. Um, so what's one thing all of you took away from being on this show? I was glad to know that after a lifetime of being raised by a family who taught you enough Yiddish to pick up on phrases, but didn't teach you all of Yiddish so they could talk about you behind your back without actually leaving the room. (laughs) Like, I don't know if any other tribe members have experienced that, but that was my childhood journey. Uh, To be able to use the Yiddish that they privied me to on on, on a project that, hey, man, that was that was definitely a good use of time after all. So, uh, you know, it was it was it was cool to meet Jonathan and that a very like-minded individual who was raised uh, probably with a very comparable background to myself and uh, in terms of the humor and the culture and how they can be huge and firm along with the TV production as well. So, uh, you know, that that was fun. It it definitely stood out from from any other project I've ever been a part of. Cool, nice. I hadn't acted in a couple of years. And when I did, uh, I had played Hitler six different times, not through, <laughs> any, not through any life course I was following, but uh, the Travel Channel played him comedically in a feature film, in a musical theater piece. 
and then hadn't acted for a long time. I was producing cabaret shows and doing uh, characters in those. And then when the pandemic hit, cabaret obviously not, not happening. And so I thought, I wonder what's going on online. I wonder if acting is happening again and found this role posted and was like, you know, this could also kind of maybe smooth over the karma a little bit. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah. So first, first serious acting in a couple of years in the film. Nice. Okay. Um, I, uh, I've lived in Pennsylvania for 25 years, but I'm a Long Island kid. And I'm always thrilled to be a part of a project where New York is one of the characters of the, uh, of the overall scheme of things. And yeah. Trillo and Suede is a New York thing. Um, and I was really happy to be a part of it for that reason, among many others. But that's one thing I took away. Awesome. That's really cool to hear. Dave? Yeah, um, I, I think one of the one of the highest compliments you can get as an actor, or you know whatever whatever um, road you choose in in this industry, when when you get invited back for a second season, um, that just speak vol speaks volumes. And and I, I can't sing Jonathan's praises enough. Um, just like again, it, it's. The, we, we've talked about the writing, you know, his, his eye for, you know, casting the right people. Um, but just, just his relentlessness with getting this thing, you know, out there. Um, I, I just, I, I can't thank him enough. Cause just, I mean, I, I, I'm a word of mouth guy. I, I really need to get better at social media, but I think I'm just a shade, just too old to be considered a millennial. Um, but anyway, <laughs> Um, I, I just, I, I try to tell as many people, you know, just bring this up and, and sometimes I'll watch it with them. Uh, other times I'll just get messages like that was, that was some real high quality stuff. Uh, yeah. you should be proud and, and everyone else should be. And I just want to extend those words to, 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 you know, everyone involved obviously here and those, those of us that couldn't make it, but it's just, uh, it's been such, such a. Uh, a cool journey um, in every sense of the word. And again, uh, it, this is why I, I, I want to do this full time. Um, it, it's just, I don't, I, you don't, I, me personally, I don't get as much out of any other job that I've done the way I, I, I all of the things that, that you, you really do get and, and receive uh, in that, in that vein from acting. Uh, and especially uh, being a part of a project like this. Awesome. That's really cool to her. Nice. Who else? Josephine. Yeah. So um, what I am going to take forward from this experience is to not limit myself because I almost didn't audition thinking that I'm not a Hasidic lady and I'm not going to be able to get all of the nuances and be true to the character. Um, and that's just that, you know, that inner critic that is telling you what you can't do all the time. But Jonathan and Kat really always gave me the sense that I could do it and that I was good to do it, good for it. Uh, and that really just gave me so much courage. Um, which is so, you know, I think every actor really needs courage, external courage, because we try to boost ourselves up, but boy, without the applause or without the feedback from other folks, it's just very, very hard to put yourself out there. So yeah, my big takeaway take from this experience is to have courage and try things that are challenging because what's the worst that can happen, you know? <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, kind of piggybacking off of what she, what uh, Josephine just said. Um, for me, it was just uh, that anything is possible and not to give up because during the time, I remember when I had applied for the breakdown and for the role, I remember thinking to myself, because this was all obviously during uh, COVID and all that. So between COVID and the lockdown and just kind of like being a sort of like in a place uh, in my uh, my life or career, if you will, where everything was just so uncertain, 
Um, I think the fact that I was able, that I was persistent enough and that I got cast and I got, was part of something that was so special and so professional and just way beyond anything that I've ever been a part of them before, just kind of reassured that basically that I made the right decision by just going with my instincts and just kind of like, you know, uh, following through and applying and believing in myself. And I say that because every actor or anybody who uh, considers themselves an entertainer or a dreamer, if you will, if you have a dream, just pursue it at all costs. Like, granted, we're always going to get doubts and we're always going to be down on ourselves and we're going to get moments where we're just going to be like, well, you know, maybe, I don't know if this is for me or not or whatever the case is, but if you have an instinct, if you have a drive in you, just keep going for it because you never know where it's going to take you. And the fact that I was that I just kind of kept at it despite all the no's uh, along the way, you know, the rejections and all that. Um, I still managed to be part of a wonderful family and uh, part of something that's multi-award winning and that uh, my friends and everybody else are proud of. And so basically this is just like reassures me and should reassure anybody else that when you have something and you want to go for it, just go for it 110%. You know, don't, don't ever doubt yourself. Nice. Really cool. Good to hear. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is it Christopher? Have you asked you? Yeah, Chris. Okay. Uh, Chris, Christopher, uh, yeah, I'll answer it almost anything. Goose is fine. Um, so it's a very different production in the sense that you watch TV and you watch movies and you go, okay, yep, that's a scene from Indiana Jones. That's a Mad Max thing. It's all been done before. And this particular genre and the way that it's set up, it was very, very, I, I really think it's unique. I don't see this, uh, you know, as much. But um, one, of, one of the things I'm taking away from it is, you know, the, the group dynamics was so positive. And it's a psychologist have run therapy groups and, and, and social skills with kids and, and whatnot. But it, it was just a very rare combination of, you know, professional. Everybody was so good. I, I was kind of surprised. Surprised. I knew they would be, but I was I was actually impressed. And it had been on other productions, you know, and and it was very positive. People were flexible. They were professional. They were good at their craft, and um, everybody was very cooperative. No complaints, and um, you know that's a top-down approach. So you know, certainly a credit to uh, Jonathan. And uh, well, I also want to mention uh, Zoe Sabrina was awesome to work with as well. Uh, that's uh, for those who, who don't, I think you all know that uh, Zoe was played by my daughter, Sabrina, right? I think, I think you all know that. I don't know if Adam knows that, but. Oh, I didn't know that, no, that's really cool. That's Zoe. She was great. Yes. Yes. Beyond her years, still. Yeah. Yes. So, very much so. She was I very much her. an extension. And very of, supportive uh, of so, all of yeah. us, I think. Oh. Yeah. The whole bit. Yeah, yep. she's a budding filmmaker in her own right. A very talented filmmaker. So I think you'll all be hearing about Sabrina someday for bigger things. Yep. Awesome. Uh, have I not, have I asked everyone? Um, Good. Oh, Joe. So, Good. Joe. No, 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 no. I, that was a thumbs oh, up. Yeah, sorry, no, we're covered. We're covered. Uh, I, I batted lead off. Oh, um, Mark, did I ask you? Yeah. yeah. I think that's it. I think I've asked everyone. So yeah, Adam, what about you? What did you like most, or what struck you most about what you've seen of it? Um, I mean, most of what everyone said. I love the dynamics between Drillo and Swade. Um, the sets are amazing. Um, all all the chemistry on set. I think it's all done perfectly well. And as people said, it's very unique in its own way. And yeah, I think Jonathan's done a very spectacular job with the series, and I hope season three goes ahead. So, thank you. No, Jonathan, you did a great job, and you're all amazing people. And it's been amazing to hear your stories on about the series. So, thank you for sharing that with me. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having us, Adam. Oh, yeah, thank you. A real treat. Thank you. Yeah, nice to see everybody again. Hopefully, yeah, all be together soon days. again. Fingers crossed. Yeah. Okay. See you later. Bye. Bye now.